Leonardo da Vinci once said that water is the driving force of all nature. Life could not exist without it, and neither could most of mankind's technological progress of the last 500 years. Water has been used for transportation, industry, commerce, and pleasure, and almost every significant settlement on Earth has been built near one large body of water or another. Water has remarkable power to create, but also to destroy, especially if we in our arrogance fail to appreciate just how powerful of a force it is. We need look no further for an example of this than Johnstown, Pennsylvania. On the morning of May the 31st, 1889, it was just one of hundreds of small but prosperous industrial towns scattered across the United States, unknown to almost everyone who didn't live in the area. But by the end of the day, it was all wiped out, swept away by a wall of water 40 feet high in an instant. Thousands lost their lives, and many more lost everything they owned, even down to the very clothes they were wearing. What made the Johnstown Flood so shocking was not merely the scale of the destruction, which was unlike anything America had seen since the end of the Civil War. It was also the simple fact that the disaster wasn't caused by an unforeseen act of God, but by a man-made structural failure that could have easily been prevented if those responsible for attempting to bend the forces of nature to their will had bothered to pay any attention to the safety of the surrounding community. Johnstown, Pennsylvania was practically born to be a steel town. The surrounding Allegheny Mountains had ample deposits of iron ore, limestone, and coal, the three ingredients needed to manufacture pig iron. The Cambria Ironworks opens in Johnstown in 1852, and it was one of the largest producers of iron in the country during the Civil War. And after the war was over, it became one of the first U.S. plants to use the new Bessemer process to mass-produce steel, which is both stronger and lighter than iron. The location of Johnstown itself made it a natural transportation hub, situated at the place where the Little Connemore and Stony Creek rivers converged to form the Big Connemore River, it was possible to transport goods by water from there to Pittsburgh, 70 miles to the west. Then it could go down the mighty Ohio and Mississippi rivers and to the profitable markets situated along them. Transportation became even easier when the Pennsylvania Railroad ran its main line between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh through Johnstown, which opened up Cambria Steel to every major city in the country. In the 1880s, Cambria had been overtaken as the largest steel producer by the massive Carnegie Steel Operation in Pittsburgh. But there was still plenty of work for it. America couldn't get enough steel, it seemed. It was being used to build everything. Railroad tracks, skyscrapers, a new fleet of U.S. Navy battleships, rifles and artillery pieces, and a host of smaller household goods from coal stoves to coffee pots. Steel was the backbone of the Industrial Revolution, the symbol of progress and economic prosperity that was heralding the United States' arrival as a world power. Johnstown, dominated as it was by factories like Cambria, and the neighboring Gautier factory, which produced barbed wire was a company town, though it tended to have a better reputation than the shanty towns overseen by coal mining barons in places like West Virginia. The 7,000 workers at the Cambria plant earned a decent living for the time, enough to buy their own houses and raise a family. The company had also invested heavily in town infrastructure, including a new hospital, streetlights, and a library. The city boasted fine hotels and restaurants, even an opera house with new performances at least once a week. Johnstown was also growing rapidly. From 8,000 residents in 1880, the population had more than doubled by the end of the decade. More than 20,000 people lived in and around Johnstown in May 1889. Fifteen miles east of Johnstown was the South Fork Dam. Construction on it started in 1838, financed by the state of Pennsylvania in order to create a reservoir that would provide water to the canal system during dry summer months. It was a relatively simple earthen dam built from layers of clay and shale with rocks known as riprap forming the outer layer on both slopes. People have been building dams like this for thousands of years, and their fairly sturdy structures provided the one important condition is met. Water can never be allowed to flow over the top of the dam. If that happens, the water will quickly erode away the internal structure, and the dam will fail. To prevent this, the original designers of the South Fork Dam built a spillway off to the side, as well as installing cast iron drainage pipes at the base of the dam that would allow an operator to reduce the level of water in the reservoir called Lake Connemore. With this rudimentary control system, as well as regular maintenance, there was no reason why the dam couldn't function without issue for decades. Unfortunately for Pennsylvania, continued financial problems meant construction on the dam was repeatedly delayed. By the time it was finally finished, after 15 years in 1853, the canal system the dam was built for had been rendered obsolete by the coming of the railroad. The canals shut down and the dam was left largely to rot for the next 25 years. In 1879, a group of Pittsburgh investors, led by Henry Clay Frick, bought the dam and the surrounding property.
property to build a country club. The South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club was intended as a place where the wealthy citizens of Pittsburgh could take a summer holiday away from the polluted air and water of the big city, a mountain retreat for the ultra-wealthy. One of the members was Frigg's business partner, Steel Baron Andrew Carnegie, one of the richest men in the world at the time. Other members included banking tycoon Andrew Mellon and attorney Philander Knox, who would go on to serve as both Attorney General and Secretary of State. The centerpiece of the club was to be Lake Connemore, which meant the South Fork Dam needed to be repaired. And this is where things started to go wrong. The men responsible for repairing the South Fork Dam were not trained engineers and had little experience with dam building. They probably assumed it was just a big mound of dirt. I mean, how hard could it be to fix it? All they did was patch the holes with a mixture of mud, straw, and rubbish and announce that it was sufficiently repaired. The most crucial mistake they made was not replacing the discharge pipes at the base of the dam, which had been sold for scrap by a previous owner. This meant that they now had no way of controlling how much water was in the dam, a fact that apparently didn't concern anyone as the level of the lake rose from 40 feet to over 60 feet, less than 10 feet from the height of the dam. Incredibly, the owners of the club decided to eat into that safety margin even further by lowering the height of the dam, removing the top three feet of earth so that the top was wide enough for a roadway. Then, after the club opened in 1881, they put a metal grate over the spillway to prevent the fish they stocked the lake with from escaping. No one thought to clean the grate, and debris eventually clogged it, severely reducing the flow of water going through the spillway. The South Fork Dam was now a ticking time bomb, and it seemed like everyone except the club's owners knew it. Any time a heavy rainstorm came through the area between 1881 and 1889, there was widespread fears that the dam was going to break, to the point of it becoming a running joke in the region. Despite this, no outside agency was responsible for inspecting South Fork or any other the dam in the country. It was assumed that the owners would behave in a responsible manner and avert disaster. The rainstorm that began on the night of May the 30th, 1889, was the worst in the recorded history of the Johnstown area up to that point. It was estimated that between 6 and 10 inches of rain was dumped on the region in a 24-hour period, so much rain that the rivers in Johnstown spilled over their banks and started flooding the lower sections of the town. Flooding was an almost routine event in the city by this point, made worse by deforestation on the surrounding hills sides and the narrowing of the river channels with landfill to build structures. Meanwhile, at the South Fork Dam, Elias Unger, president of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club and the man ultimately responsible for overseeing the dam, awoke on the morning of May the 31st and realized he had a major problem on his hands. Lake Connemore had been swollen by a night of heavy rainfall, and the water level was now only a couple of feet from the top of the dam. A desperate attempt was made to remove the grate from the spillway to increase water flow, to increase the height of the dam, even cut a new spillway to try and relieve the water pressure. But it was all too late. At 3 p.m., water started spilling over the top of the dam, and 15 minutes later, the center of the dam gave way. The lake was two miles long, a mile wide, and over 70 feet deep at this point, an estimated 20 million tons of water. For the estimated 40 minutes it took the lake to drain completely, it was believed that the force and volume of water flowing through the breach equaled that which flows over Niagara Falls. The flood followed the path of least resistance through the valley, roaring down South Fork Creek to where it merged with the Little Connemore River. Everything that stood in the path of the flood was destroyed and swept away. The water picked up a huge amount of debris from the areas it passed through, like destroyed buildings, trees that had been ripped out of the ground, railroad ties, and boulders. It behaved like a tsunami, the top of the wave continually crashing down like a pile driver. Many of the flood's victims were crushed to death before they had a chance to drown. When the flood hit the town of East Connemore, it wiped out the Pennsylvania Railroad Depot there, claiming passengers on trains as victims. Entire locomotives were carried off by the flood, houses lifted off their foundations and swept along until they smashed into more debris and broke up. The flood took Johnstown completely by surprise when it arrived an hour after the dam broke. Three warnings had been sent to the city that day from South Fork via telegraph, but because of the previous false alarms, no one took the warning seriously. The wall of debris became more and more deadly as it went. At Woodvale, the flood destroyed the Gautier factory, carrying off thousands of feet of barbed wire. The flood struck Johnstown with tremendous force, moving at an estimated speed of 20 to 30 miles an hour. A wall of water and wreckage 35 feet high slammed into the city, wiping out almost every building it struck. As the flood rounded the bend and entered the Connemore River, it struck the large stone railway bridge that spanned the river. Incredibly, the bridge held, and much of the debris piled up against it, creating a new dam that was almost watertight. 
The flood now rebounded off the bridge, some of it going up the channel of the Stony Creek River, temporarily reversing its flow and striking the town of Kernville opposite from Johnstown. The rest swirled around in a whirlpool around Johnstown, doing even more damage and grinding up the debris into smaller pieces until a portion of the wreckage at the bridge gave way and the water poured through. There were incredible stories from some of the survivors about the ordeal they went through. 16-year-old Victor Heiser clung to the roof of his family's barn when the flood struck, being carried for miles downriver before he was able to reach the shore. His parents were both killed inside their dry goods store. There were also tales of heroism of men who jumped into the flood water to save people, especially young children. But mostly, the stories were just tragic, of entire families wiped out in an instant, of parents who could do nothing but watch helplessly as their children and disappeared under the waves. The flood was so powerful it tore the clothes off victims, leaving many survivors at risk from hypothermia. And the horror of the disaster wasn't over yet. At some point the debris piled against the railroad bridge caught fire. At least 80 people trapped in the pile who had survived the floods were now burned alive. The scale of the disaster was more than most people could fathom. Pictures of Johnstown in the aftermath of the flood resemble European cities that had been bombed during World War II. Thousands of homes and businesses were completely destroyed or heavily damaged. The total cost of the flood was estimated at $17 million, over half a billion dollars in today's money. But what drew people's attention was the human cost. The death toll was eventually set at 2,209 people, at the time the worst disaster in American history. Over a century later, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the 9 11 attacks have surpassed the Johnstown flood in terms of man made disaster fatalities on U.S. soil. The casualties included 99 entire families and over 400 children under the age of 10. For those who survived the flood, their ordeal wasn't over. Many had lost everything they owned. Their clothes, as if they had any, were soaked through by flood water and the persistent rain that continued to fall throughout the night after the disaster. There was little food and the water had been contaminated. They needed help quickly or many more people would die. Journalists and photographers passed the horrific news on to the rest of the country. The flood headlined newspapers in all corners of the United States. Help came largely from private citizens and companies as well as the National Guard which was called in by the state's governor. The Pennsylvania Railroad worked hard to restore the track between Pittsburgh and Johnstown and relief trains began pouring in bringing supplies and volunteers. One of the most notable relief workers was Clara Barton. The 67-year-old Barton had become famous as the angel of the battlefield during during the Civil War for her help tending to wounded soldiers, and in 1881 she founded an American chapter of the International Red Cross in Switzerland. Barton led a team of 50 Red Cross doctors and nurses to Johnstown, and she stayed there for five months without a break, caring for injured and sick survivors and working to provide them with food and shelter. Johnstown was the first major disaster since the American Red Cross had been founded, and Barton's work helped cement it as one of the country's premier disaster relief organizations. A total of $3.7 million was raised through private donations, and tons of supplies were sent via train to Johnstown to relieve the suffering of the surviving residents. Work crews spent weeks on cleanup operations. The debris piled against the railroad bridge was particularly problematic since tangled spools of barbed wire bound the wreckage together, making it difficult to move. Eventually, dynamite was used to shift it. It took a long time to recover the bodies of those killed in the disaster. Bodies were being fished out of the river as far away as Cincinnati, 400 miles to the west of Johnstown. For years after the disaster, bodies of flood victims were being uncovered. As late as 1911, skeletons were found. The dead bodies of horses and other farm animals killed in the disaster needed to be collected and disposed of as well to prevent the outbreak of diseases like typhoid fever. In the aftermath of the Johnstown's flood, there was much anger directed at members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. The American Society of Civil Engineers investigated the failure of the South Fork Dam and uh, were harshly critical of the dam's design, particularly the alterations made by the club from 1879 to 1881. However, no one was ever held legally responsible for the disaster. Several lawsuits against the club and its members were dismissed because no one could prove that anyone had been deliberately negligent. In the decades after the disaster, a new legal 
legal standard known as strict liability was adopted in the United States, in part because of the fallout from the Johnstown flood. Under the principle of strict liability, if a dam failed today, its owners would be held financially liable for the damage that the resulting flood caused, whether or not the dam had failed as the result of negligence, because maintaining a reservoir is considered an inherently dangerous activity. The club abandoned the South Fork area after the disaster, liquidating their remaining assets in 1904. The clubhouse and the remains of the dam, which is still visible, covered by grass, are now maintained by the National Park Service as part of a national memorial commemorating the Johnstown flood. Johnstown rebuilt after the disaster. Within a year, the Cambria Ironworks was back in operation. The city continued to grow, reaching a peak of 67,000 in 1920. But flooding continued to be a problem in Johnstown as spring rainstorms continued to overwhelm the rivers and inundate the city. This culminated in the St. Patrick's Day flood of 1936, when a third of the city was covered by 17 feet of water, killing 25 people and doing $43 million in damage. That's about $918 million today. Congress passed a series of flood control acts, which provided funding for infrastructure projects to reduce the risk of flooding along America's rivers. Johnstown's River was dredged by the Army Corps of Engineers, and a series of flood walls were built. When this was completed, Johnstown was declared flood-free. However, while the flood control measures put in place cut down on regular storm flooding, no regulation had yet been devised for control and maintenance of dams in the United States. Responsibility for their safety continued to be the sole purview of their owners, and while many impressive modern dams were being constructed of concrete like the Hoover Dam, there were still thousands of old earthen dams like the one that had failed at South Fork that nobody was really paying attention to. In July 1977, a severe thunderstorm system drenched the Johnstown area, what was described as a 500-year flood by authorities. It proved too much for six dams in the area, which failed. The largest of these was the Laurel Run Dam, which unleashed 100 million gallons of water onto the sleeping residents of the town of Tanneryville, killing 40 people. The Laurel Run Dam failure was one of a string of high-profile disasters in the 1970s that spurred government action with President Jimmy Carter instructing the Army Corps of Engineers to inspect every high-hazard dam in the nation. Today, the National Dam Safety Program is a partnership between the federal government and 49 of the 50 states. Alabama does not currently participate that works to ensure dam safety throughout the country. The Corps of Engineers and FEMA maintain the national inventory of dams, an online database of 91,000 dams that, if they failed, would cause widespread destruction and injury. Still, the system isn't perfect, funding is limited, and there are only so many state and government inspectors to go around. From 2005 to 2013, there were 173 dam failures in the United States and 587 near misses. And with the nation's inventory of dams getting older, the current average age of 60 years, the likelihood of continued failures is only going to increase as time goes by. As for Johnstown, the city macabrely nicknamed Flood City, it was able to withstand its many natural disasters, but was unable to survive the economic downturn that came with the collapse of the American steel industry in the 1970s. Bethlehem Steel, the owner of the Cambria factory, closed it down in 1992, after over a decade of declining profits, putting thousands out of work. The city has never really financially recovered, dwindling to a population of 18,000 in 2020, and at one point listed as the least likely city in the United States to attract newcomers. There has been some recovery in the form of new factories producing aerospace parts and wind turbines, but a lot of Johnstown's appeal these days is tourism. The old ironworks is a national historic landmark, and of course signs of the famous 1889 flood are everywhere. Beside the site of the dam failure that is maintained by the Park Service, there's also the Johnstown Flood Museum containing artifacts and pictures from the disaster, and the Stone Railroad Bridge at the center of the tragedy still stands today, freight trains rumbling over it. Up at the hill at Grandview Cemetery is a plot commemorating the 777 victims of the disaster whose remains were unidentified. On Memorial Day weekend, Johnstown honors not just its war dead, but also marks the anniversary of one of the worst disasters in American history. The primary benefit from learning about a historical disaster is in the lessons imparted from it. So what can we do as a society to prevent it from happening again? In the case of Johnstown, the lessons learned are obvious. To make sure all construction projects, dams included, take the safety of those affected by them into account when they're being erected. But another lesson that may not be as obvious is that mankind needs to pay heed to the enormous power of water, not only to sustain, but to destroy as well. If we want to continue to proclaim ourselves masters of our environment, we need to pay attention to what happens to Johnstown, lest we forget and our environment ends up the master instead of us instead.